Thanks very much, uh, everyone, for being here. Uh, I'm going to talk in English just to avoid double translation because I have the basic information on Professor Sarikakis in English, and I don't want to translate on the fly and have the translator translate it back to Croatian. So I'm just going to start speaking in English because it's very brief. Uh, thank you, first of all, Professor Sarikakis. This is very inconvenient. Okay. Uh, for being here, uh, Professor Sarikakis, as most of you probably know, comes from the University of Vienna, where she's, uh, she's been working since 2011. Previously, she was at the University of Leeds between 2004 and 2011. Um, she's the founding co-editor of the International Journal of Media and Cultural Politics. She served as chair of the Communication Law uh, and Policy section of ACREA for six years. She's also a re-elected member of the executive board of ACREA and member of the International Council of the International Association for Media and Communications Research. Um, she has consulted with various international, intergovernmental and other organizations. Uh, and the media on media policy and rights issues. Um, currently, she's preparing a book uh, on, or a research monograph that explores issues of control over citizenship through commercial and political surveillance and communication and cultural policies of copyright, labor, and ownership. And the book is titled Communication and Control, contracted by Palgrave Macmillan, and we look forward to reading the book uh, when it comes out. Uh, so, uh, without um, further ado, uh, Professor uh, Sarikakis will give a lecture on um, the culture and the new single market, reproducing regimes of dominance or rebooting the new Europe. Particularly interesting, at least in my opinion, is the historical comparison with some previous policy uh, initiatives at the EU level. So. for later, uh, so um, uh, thank you so much uh, for the invitation. First of all, I am uh, honored to be here. It's the first time in uh, Croatia, um, although I'm, I live right next door, so thank you so much. Um, and uh, I'm very excited to be here. I've learned already so much yesterday, and. I feel really refreshed because um, culture is an area I'm very much interested in and I feel very passionate about, culture in the broader sense. And like many of your speakers yesterday, I think that discussing culture is not just a matter of discussing only high arts, for example, or, or museums, but also um, so many other things from media and media uh, ownership, as we had some uh, discussion yesterday, um, um, the role of uh, journalists, um, archives, um, basically everything that bears um, the potential for cultural expression and, of course, um, participation of citizens and not participation in the kind of, uh, you know, um, decorative manner, but substantial participation um, in the sense of uh, shaping the world we live in and shaping our own fate. Um, so again, thank you for giving me this uh, platform uh, to express a few thoughts. Um, when the invitation came uh, to present a talk um, about um, the digital single market, um, I thought uh, to myself, um, I thought it's like totally easy, it's one of the same. <laughs> Do I really want to uh, talk about it? I'll finish in two seconds. Um, but of course, when one starts uh, thinking about it more, one feels the need to connect the dots that seem to be disconnected. So. Um, <coughs> Um, what I'm, uh, I'll try to do here is to provide, provide a sketch of thinking about this particular piece of legislation without even talking about it very much. Because like we also discussed yesterday, there's so many aspects to consider even before one goes there. So it feels a little bit like 
you have this piece of legislation uh, from the European uh, Union, European Commission, and then in order to understand it, you need to step out of it and look all around you and then go back to it and see to what extent does it fulfill its mission. And one of the things that um, I suppose, at, at least for, for me as a, uh, as a scholar with uh, also a political science background and, and media background, and various different hats that connect academia and the real world, um, it's important for me to understand when a policy is designed and proposed and then decided upon, what, what is its normative just justification? Um, and what kind of um, priorities are being um, discussed and shown and considered legitimate while designing this? And of course, um, it's important, again, as a, you know, academics do, tend to do, is to look at the context of things. So, um, looking at the context of things, one of the fundamental areas to look at is, of course, the construction of Europe itself. I know it sounds very old, but this has determined the way both Europeans experience each other's cultures, but also it has determined the very future, at this point, the very future of the continent of its citizens. And I'm saying this in relation to the response given by the European Union as a whole to the haunting, um, uh, the haunting ghost of the financial crisis. The elephant in the room that we do not want to talk about very much. The construction of Europe has always been predominantly economic. Emphasis was always to its economic characteristics. And the priority economic aims have taken over other domains uh, has been visible. And these domains have been, for example, cultural policy or political integration. And the emergence of the European project also brought to the light the claim that Europe needs media that talk about Europe and political integration was a process in which media would play, could play an important role. And media, of course, are totally inherent in anything regarding culture. Media in any forms and formats you may, uh, you may uh, imagine. Integration has been an important but much used and contested political claim in the making of the EU. Um, but it has not always perceived only in economic terms, especially by citizens, in the sense of creating a single market. And also within the EU itself, the vision, so to speak, um, the mission statement of the EU has, no, has not been, as you know, um, homogenous. Um, <clears throat> different parties have um, a different, different visions, if you like, um, have been at conflict, have been clashing, what should the EU, the European Union, what should the project of integration be? And the voices uh, uh, have been also very strong in terms of political, social, and cultural integration. Or in terms of, if we think in terms of the political um, architecture, the collaborative coexistence of institutions, the mobility of people, services, ideas. Even the institutional architecture of the EU represents these conflicts. For example, the, the genesis of the European Parliament as the only um, um, international uh, representation of citizens in global politics as an institution uh, of direct representation of citizens is not a small thing um, by its conception if we think about it. So there you have it, the visions about Europe already clashing, contrasting, um, being uh, at odds with each other. And uh, it's important to, to remember that um, these visions have also borne arguments, for example, that any attempt towards a political and cultural unity would require a form of public sphere or a constellation of public spheres where civil society and political institutions interact, where the macro level, if you like, in uh, analytical terms, meets the micro level, the everyday life of citizens. That is where culture resides. Um, 
uh, Habermas argued in 2012 that, you know, after the uh, first uh, crisis wave, financial crisis, that what is being tested nowadays in Europe of crisis is the will of the citizens, of the politicians, and the mass media to proceed with the next step of integration. But I think Habermas left out the potency of the market to steer significantly this direction and the spirit of policies. Perhaps more precisely said, one can argue that what is being tested today in Europe is which direction Europe should take and to what extent EU decisions reflect the aims of the common good. These historical battles take place not only in the streets, for example, in protests, in graffiti, or street theater, in the, in the polling stations, or the EU institutions even, but crucially in the media and cultural contents. The topics and the ways in which these issues are being discussed, the level of debate, the level of civility, if you like, if we think about the rise in hate speech, nowadays, the echo chambers, uh, the level of inclusion, and this old-fashioned uh, sociological term, the level of empowerment of citizens, and the ways in which our communicative democracies deal with threats to their own existence due to the crisis, due to the crisis, many crises. So historically, the area of culture is seen as an area that would provide citizens with a European identity, would strengthen European citizenship, all these things that we've been here and rehearsing, quite rightly so, um, all these years, was related to the media, such as, for example, public service broadcasters, uh, highlights the attention given to the vision of Europe. However, regulation, as we know, um, of the, in the domain of culture did not take place before 92. And um, culture has also not been seen very significantly or seriously as a, as a core element of political direction for the EU. At the same time, a combination of reluctance to regulate the market, concentration of media ownership, the acceleration of cross-border private media traffic, continued challenges, to the function of public service media. For some countries, the failed, if you like, the failed, perhaps, attempt of state media to transform themselves to public service uh, communicative spaces have set very specific conditions for the public spheres we're experiencing in Europe today. And therefore, for culture, this has meant two conflicting areas. Culture is, uh, became a terrain for, con is, is actually, is a terrain for connection, for learning, for democratic participation, ways of life, of, as I said, including both high arts and popular art and other means, but it also meant an economic terrain, the support of which would be conditioned according to its potential for monetization. If we look at cultural governance, therefore, deriving from this very beginnings on conflicting visions about Europe, uh, and even better said, culture governance. So not just the governance of cultural objects or institutions or even subjects, but culture as a whole and bigger and more complex system. Referring to the arts, education, even media, media contents, production, all kinds of things is situated, as we know, at the core of democracy and can, especially in times of economic and political pressures and insecurity, provide an important field of communication. So cultural governance contains domains that respond to the idea of culture as a field of political contestation and dialogue, but also to the economics of cultural industries. As Barnett said, the governmentalization of culture has been link linked to understanding culture as an instrument for social transformation. Or, as Holden said, recognizing the value of culture for the public. Times of growing economic and social insecurity require particularly the rebuilding of trust and the sense of belonging to a community 
through protection and recreation of cultural spaces accessible for all citizens. And here I include citizens at large, therefore not necessarily national subjects, but also citizens in the form of human beings, um, whether passing through or staying in um, what we call national territories, nation states. Um, economic and political theorists argue that crises are imminent to liberal and capitalist systems and are re reoccurring symptom, sympt symptoms excuse me, of systematic failures driven by economic progress. One notion of capitalism refers back to the normalization of crisis as feeding capitalism in its fundamentalist form. The French regulation school overall argues, among other things, that crisis is, is a phase inherent in capitalism, which does not destroy or transform or weaken it, but really accelerates it. And this takes place through privatization, new forms of liberalization, and most possibly through the technologization of social and political claims. A situation is identified as one of crisis where discrepancy between the existing state and some standard would lead, which leads to the perception of crisis is noticeable. So variables that indicate crisis are surprise, threat, pressure, and uncertainty. And I think in Europe of today, we're experiencing all four of them. Crisis threatens valued goals, restricts political uh, decisions time, creates moments of surprise, and consequently, Vacuums of political power and decisions rise and offer space for new stakeholders and the shifting of policy goals. Habermas again engaged with the idea of system crisis as a system of dysfunctions in the economic, political, administrative, and the social cultural subsystems. Therefore, a crisis might lead to system contradictions and steering problems, to the loss of control that creates the deterioration of trust of the masses into the political administration, which manifests in the crisis of governmentality. Sorry, governmentality. This can trigger a vicious circle that emanates in a situation of permanent crisis. And this is when situations earlier perceived as one of crisis become normality. If you think about it, if we are now completing the first decade of financial crisis in Europe, perhaps Habermas has a point. Therefore, it's important to take into account the questions of normalization, regularization, the change of policy uh, paradigms, and even perhaps the insistence of specific policy paradigms, despite the fact that these have proven not necessarily successful, such as previous policies, again, in terms, for example, of media liberalization, the promise for um, richer public spheres, uh, the mm. promise for a richer political um, dialogue, the promise for more creation, the creation of jobs, the creation of more stability, even the promise of dominance of Europe in the world in the field of, of culture and media and technology even. Often, when we look at um, uh, policy, uh, the policy domain of the European Union, we get a sense that um, these conflicts bet uh, uh, between visions about Europe um, cannot overcome themselves. So it's important to think against to what criteria we're looking at these, um, at these policies. Uh, and also to situate Europe within for, uh, a bigger context of globalization, which, yeah, it still exists, although <coughs> the term is not particularly um, trendy anymore. Um, Oscar Necht, for example, identifies globalization of markets as the main reason for the cuts in public cultural funding, as international enterprises are seized, um, have seized tax releases rather than cultural budgets fostered through tax policies. Even in cases where the European countries have tried to um, deprive, um, uh, de excuse me, derive tax from um, uh, telecoms, for example, they have been told by competition policy in the EU that they're not allowed to do that. So 
we are finding ourselves in a vicious circle. On the one hand, many budgets, especially for culture, have been cut precisely due to the fact that um, na national budgets are uh, running low. And then the attempt uh, to derive uh, more funding for private enterprises is being stopped at this particular level. Therefore, the sense of public goods is their existence independently from possessions uh, of the market. The argument here being public goods, such as culture, have to be um, ring-fenced no matter what the economic and financial uh, system might be. Uh, and this might even go against uh, European Union regulation. Um, NEGD further argues that the privatization of public goods, which is the second tier of the destruction of public spaces, if you think about it, leads first to an explosive tension within society, as well as to the loss of substantial distance of those public goods. And with that, he also includes cultural goods. So when, for example, we take uh, the domain of uh, public service media or media or or cultural institutions, when they are deprived from the economic foundations, then not only what we call the democratization of culture recedes, but also is not gained back. Because the terms and conditions that these cultural goods are given back to the public are completely different and are based, again, are based on monetization, which means so many different things. It means, for example, ability to pay, which comes also with social strata, comes with other skills um, combined um, as part of the cultural capital of, um, of citizens and society, um, a, a big um, vicious circle. So fearing the loss of sense of community, NECT calls to fight for the publicity to satisfy the needs of the people for humanized social life and solidarity. Um, a very important dimension, I suppose, of, of culture. The policy actions identified in uh, the European Union domain can be distinguished as preventive or reactive, depending on the economic standing of the nation state. Um, again, as this is defined by its national elites, but also external actors involved in financial governance. And this is, this is, these are the institutions as we learn to call them in Greece, uh, European Central Bank, the Commission, the IMF, um, and other not necessarily legitimate uh, decision makers. An example I'll give you as direct consequence of the governance of these institutions in the Greek uh, example is, uh, is, is a very simple one, which has led to the destruction of both um, know-how and human capital, on the one hand, um, and has led to the uh, severe deprivation of accessibility to culture. Um, a very simple, if you like, uh, monetary, economically driven um, policy, which required that local authorities give up their autonomy in deciding about cultural matters to bigger regional um, uh, authorities. So smaller local authorities were subsumed in bigger ones. And therefore, this led to the following inability of little towns, for example, small towns, to even make decisions about sweeping the streets, about um, uh, creating uh, local festivals. And when you take this and combine it with the fact that most small nations in, in Europe are peripheral, geographically and geopolitically, then it's important to ask the question, what kind of European identity really are we talking about? Is this a European identity that, is, that considers itself secondary, subservient to certain other identities to which we're looking at, both in terms of 
administrative models, economic models, even, if you like, moral models. And what kind of spaces exist in these border spaces, for example, um, for self-reflection, self-expression, um, autonomy, self-governance? I have not thanked the uh, interpreters, so thank you so much. Are you catching up with me? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, it's a big, uh, it's a big deal. So thanks very much. Um, how do we come? Oh dear. How do we come to the point of um, even discussing? the digital single market. What does it remind us of? For those of us who have been looking at European Union policies and integration, we think, oh, deja vu, it just has the word digital in front of it. Remember, we had exactly the same discourses when we had, in the, in the late 80s, when we had the, the first directive on the audiovisual, um, uh, the audiovisual directive, it was called Television Without Frontiers. And the promises were, again, about um, uh, employment, uh, skills in Europe, um, the place of Europe in the world, and the, um, how can I put it, the unavoidable, that's the fourth element of the discourse, the unavo unavoidability, is there such a word? The unavoidable element we have to. There is no other policy alternative. That was one. The second wave, again in media, came a bit later with the so-called new media overall and the single market again, and we had exactly the same dimensions. This is where the Creative Europe came from. This is where the media programs came from. The, the discourses were again, technology uh, is imperative. Uh, jobs will be um, uh, created. Um, Europe will become uh, powerful again, or vis-a-vis -vis Hollywood and um, and Japan, and uh, there is no other way. So in the digital single market, we see exactly the same terminology, and this is the phenomenon of capture of poli of policy by both uh, concerns uh, um, uh, by technologized, if you like, um, discourse and the discourse of inevitability. And because of the EU institutional architecture, these conflicting visions about the EU are now reflected precisely on the cultural domain. And this cultural domain represents the fragmentation of policy. If culture had been the core concern of the EU, it would not have appeared fragmented. It is a method of normalization, regularization of seeing and conceiving culture, indeed, as a secondary to economy, politics, and so on, not an, as an inherent element. And also, it's, um, I think, I will say it, it is an ideological construct um, that culture is still considered as a luxury item and not a human right. Yesterday, we heard about lack of media strategy, numerous directives at play when considering culture, digitalization, uh, the reasons why culture has been uh, seen just as a matter of heritage or as a matter of private endeavor. And this is all precisely because the, the whole idea of access, accessing culture, and let me say one more, add one more dimension here, perhaps for our discussions, where the next panels they have a lot to say, I'm sure, in terms of copyright and in terms of archives. What about the dimension of culture making? Not culture making by artists or recognized artists, but culture making in everyday life by youth, by children, by everyone, and in every single aspect in their lives. So it has been predominantly pushed to extremes, this idea of culture, 
either something belongs to a museum to be looked at or something that is uh, of a popular kind of popular art which we can download on our mobile devices. And there is no connection either between these two poles or to the third pole, which is the participation in the polis. There's a lot of stuff I've written here, which I'm not going to go through. But I th want to say the following. I suppose, yes. So we can have a discussion also. Experience tells us, looking back into the uh, cultural policy trajectory of the EU, that even the pro programs that have we as scholars, but also the culture making communities, have looked at, such as the media program, for example, have seemed generous and important. And some are, in some aspects, they are, of course if one, of course, does not compare them with other programs. Um, the fragmentation continues. Even wonderful projects such as Europeana has not managed, not by any fault of itself or its conception, but because of the context within which it appears, has not managed or has not um, um, programmed um, to be the driving force behind national um, institutions. I will speak now for the next two minutes with another hat, not of the scholar, but of the chair of the administrative board of the public service broadcaster ERT in Greece, the, and the particular branch, the um, ERT3, which is um, the arm of the uh, public service broadcaster that um, caters for the periphery, uh, so not for Athens, but the whole of Greece with regional culture and, and media. It is simply frustrating to not have the human capital to access these wonderful programs that the DSM is offering or ex explaining or proposing through other programs the previous FP7, Creative Europe, all these kinds of funding programs. It's frustrating to have seen that there is no infrastructure. And we heard that yesterday too. Infrastructure is lacking from various countries. And the reasons for that, I was thinking about it so much. I'm sure there is literature about it somewhere. I need to read it. But I was thinking, it is no coincidence that small nations who have allowed or were forced to take in bigger nation's priorities and ways of doing things, administrative uh, ways of doing things perhaps, have not managed to find their own voice. It concerns me when I hear that this country, that country, that country are looking to study to adopt the British model, the German model, or, or the French model. It feels like the regeneration of colonialism in different ways. Allow me to be a little bit provocative. It is not about nationalism. It is not about us versus anybody, them. Absolutely not. It is about um, shaping the spaces through which even our self-governance needs to be designed and structured. And we cannot find our voice when we constantly look at other models that are not necessarily, that are not necessarily uh, pro uh, profitable for us. So um, infrastructure obstacles are there. They're not limited to the building of things to enable the DSM. Um, it's not simply about optical fiber connections. Uh, most importantly, I think it's about human capital. It's about know-how. Um, a colleague yesterday, um, I think the forum journalist, uh, said uh, it's about speaking, speaking the same language, sp saying the words, to be able to access um, various uh, resources. And 
the truth of the matter is the DSM was tailored to the capacities of strong economies and markets of scale. And we know who they are, of course, and we need to be careful about the priorities that DSM offers or proposes. There are three areas, I will finish with that, um, there are three areas that are important, I think, to look at. They are neglected areas, um, generally, um, they are maybe discussed here, but outside this room, the this debate is not very intense. Um, there are three areas uh, I think they're important to look at in terms of this new single market. One is the role of archives, not as uh, museum items, not as items of preservation, not because of the only of the noble cause to protect history and so on and so forth, but also the renewed role of archives in countering misinformation, what we call fake news, in countering political apathy or numbness, and in countering the withdrawal of citizens from the public sphere or the shrinkage of public spaces. We did research on four countries the, uh, 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 in terms of the, um, the, the conditions of their archives, the priorities they have. They told us many things, but two stand out. Copyright, the legal, underfunding, the structural. There's m many other things, but they flagged out these two things. Even when archives are beautiful and preserved, copyright stops people from accessing and stops their democratization. The second area is children and youth. We discussed yesterday, very, very briefly, um, the need for the development of digital skills. The, ne the need is not the development of digital skills to access any technology or any content. The times are gone, I think. We're losing the battle for democracy if we are stuck with this idea. Uh, the digital skills we need are skills that empower to affect content and use content for empowerment. Therefore, we should be calling them something like democratic informational digital skills. And the final thing area, which was discussed yesterday, and a colleague also um, uh, gave a very uh, good paper, I want to know more about the research method, um, is the issue of media ownership and media control. If you think about it, our social platforms are fully privately owned. If the DSM has anything to say about Europe's place in the world, then it should look into platforms that are public, publicly run and publicly owned with respect to human rights. Thank you so much. So what, what was particularly interesting for me was the parallel that you drew with the television without frontiers, mm -hmm. which is basically now the digital single market seems to be an updated version of a response to a perceived cultural imperialism, so to speak, uh, mostly from the US companies and even within the documents uh, presented within the framework of the strategy, there's acknowledgement. European companies only have 4% of total market capitalization and so on. Mm -hmm. So what would be an ideal response from us as academics, as public intellectuals? What would be the historical lesson uh, yeah. from this perspective? What can we do mm -hmm. to change 
the uh, outcomes this time around. Mm. Because what, what was suggested previously was we don't want American capitalism, we want European capitalism yeah. with very little public funding yeah. so that we feel good about ourselves as Europeans. Yeah. So what can we do in this situation now in 2018 right. within this framework to at least try to push the debate in a different direction? Yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, I think the lessons, thank you. I think the lessons we learned um, were that, to a great extent, all these programs have boosted, of course, uh, the European audiovisual space. That is undeniable, that is for sure. Um, but what we have not answered are two things. One, what has been the opportunity cost? So what have we um, supported to the expense of what? What other directions would have been um, you know, open um, to European societies. For sure, we have neglected anything that comes from bottom up, and for sure, in order for the market, that is media, I'm sorry, that is media that are uh, either not-for-profit or community-based, local, um, uh, basically with some element of public control. Um, the second thing that we've done is to shrink the existing public communication spaces, which is public service media, and if we did not shrink them, we put them under state control, therefore further delegitimize their existence. I think the battle is really, or the struggle, uh, is really at the point of public communicative spaces. The degree of publicness in Europe is something we need to preserve, we need to really come together, all forces. So, and what we have learned also is that through these um, uh, European programs, we have benefited the so-called enemy. You know, I, I, I like Hollywood, I would watch, I totally loved uh, Wonder Woman, I mean, hello. Um, but this is not the only story, right? We should have more stories, and what the media program and other programs have done is to do two things, I think. One is to homogenize the stories that are coming out from this continent uh, because people trying to gain funding had to water down authenticity, you know, originality maybe. Uh, and we have indirectly, perhaps even directly, subsidized Hollywood further. And the Hollywood story is I know it's an example, we keep on looking at it and, and bringing it up, but it exists since the beginning of the 20th century. I mean, the first policies was with the UK, how the US uh, wanted to enter the UK market and in the 1920s, and any attempt to provide any kind of quarters of not more than had not functioned. So it is, it's, we're gonna carry this with us and that is okay. Um, so um, I don't know if I'm answering the question. I think that if we look at policy, so these are the lessons. The lessons. Now, as scholars, public intellectuals, uh, what can we do? A couple of things. I think some, we are kind of doing them. We need to be stronger at that, I suppose. One is build alliances. The, 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 build alliances with many different communities and anybody who wants to listen to academics. The truth of the matter is that there is very much anti-intellectualism in our politics, European and national. And this is also reflected on the EU level, whereby we also see nepotism and political nepotism. And then we ask ourselves, all these bright minds couldn't they just add two more paragraphs, for example? Two more measures? No. no. <laughs> exactly. And I think part of it, part of it is the power of commercial lobbies, um, political nepotism, and anti-intellectualism. Um, that is, so the, the, building alliances is one. And I think uh, academics themselves uh, have also themselves to blame to a great extent because academia has seen itself very much as kind of objective or disconnected or distanced. I don't know, you can put the attribute um, from the world um, and um, 
journalists are also a problem here. Political will is missing. There's a list. There's a list. I stop there. Thank you. <laughs> a brave. from archives world, so I'm the archivist for more than 20 years and almost 20 years working for the International Archival Community. I'm also executive board of Eurobica, of ICA and many other bodies. I can say, really I think that I can say that not just funding, you, you, I'm very glad that you point out the archives is the first for the least what need to be changed. Funding, everybody will say, lack of resources, anybody will say, but competencies in the archival and archival profession. This is one of the priorities of International Council of Archives. In countries like Croatia, I can say it with full responsibility in the countries of the former Eastern Bloc of some of types of the countries in Europe, uh, to be put in the mic of the profession that we are a public service, not administration service, not government service, but public service. It is like, you know, when you said, uh, when we have the meetings in European Union bodies, hmm. the difference between 28 countries, uh, what, how we, uh, how we imagine archival service, how we see it as uh, professionals, what archival service is, and it's really impossible to build in some countries the idea, because it depends on the politics, that archival archives is public, archival service should be public service. Yeah. Yeah. And so this is why the building of competencies, not just digital competencies, but professional competencies and any other type, is now one of the first priorities of International Council of Archives, of Eurbica, and Devna, and every other archival professional body in Europe. Thank you so much for that. I, uh, I started getting interested in archives from a very kind of, uh, um, how can I say, from a sense of urgency. Um, archives never really drew my attention um, because of ignorance. So one part is the public image of archives and public understanding of the, of the importance. When the public service broadcaster in Greece was shut down overnight in 2013 by the then government, what we noticed was that archival material was appearing somehow in private television. Uh, well, it was a matter of looting, yeah? Excuse me. <laughs> so and and then of course uh, there was self governance of the of the broadcaster the kind of pirate or fourth model of governance what everyone wants to call it but of course with very few resources because people were uh, unemployed uh, and, and not paid um, 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 under almost police attack and stuff like that so and the question was what happens to the archives. Who's looking after our history? Who's the guardian of history? Who's the guardian of our, our whoever our is? Um, and this is how I entered this world. And all I can say is the unsung heroes of archives, you know, and how they are seen and marginalized, I believe, they're marginalized from the main core functions of, of media, while at the same time, archives are being nicely and quietly taken away by uh, private companies, either through models of digitalization and pri pu public-private uh, partnerships. So the private sector enters a foot, puts, has a foot into this huge reach realm. And this is one big question about the ownership of archives. And this is public, and we should stop this somehow. And the other, of course, is if this is public, this is the alliance one of the alliances I'm talking about, which is the archives should become, should go out there in the world. We have to pursue this. And it is very difficult, I know, but um, anyway, yes.
Um, thank you very much for a thought-provoking uh, lecture. Oh, it was, uh, very interesting. Harry Verwijn from Europeana. Ah, hello. Um, hello. <laughs> um, so I have a, this question. I think what, it, what your lecture did to me is you, you want to recast the digital single market in a perspective if it's either a reproducing regimes of dominance or rebooting. rebooting a new Europe. And that seems to hinge very much on the idea of the public sphere, mm -hmm. right? And of course, you made the remark about Europeana. Uh, on the one side, we're doing some good things. Thank you for that. But you also <laughs> mentioned that uh, it fails to um, engage national institutions, if I understood correctly, uh, sufficiently. And my question would be, what are your recommendations to do that better? It's not a matter of uh, Europeana only, because I know very well from how the national institutions themselves have such huge problems of survival, mm -hmm. of culture, not appreciating, not understanding the need. And also, I have to say, I'm sorry, <coughs> I don't think that, that necessarily our political elites understand what is at hand. So, uh, we can discuss mm, tactics for Europeana, perhaps, but strategies is difficult because you always depend on, unless there's a force from above, <laughs> like the GDPR now, for example, that forces national, national institutions and funds them to digitalize and share. For example, in Greece, digitalization has stopped completely. There's simply no money, there's nothing. Um, and the archives um, under-operate, under-function, because there's a lot, of, a lot of people had to be let go because of the institutions managing the crisis, austerity. I mean, these are the, this is why I said also earlier that culture is considered as a, as a luxury and as an add-on and not a human right. But we are faced with these ideas now, the, the, the phenomena of misinformation, that they are so immediate in our experience, so in front of us. And we need to make this um, conceptual connection for the rest of society. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Final question. Sorry, Goran Kahorian from museum <laughs> sector. Uh, we are aware that information represents and is seen more and more as, a, as something that enables uh, empowering of the people and normally it is more and more the concern of commercial sector as well. Uh, so there are really huge concerns in museums about the information, how it is kept, uh, uh, transmitted, distributed to uh, uh, the wider audience to achieve social benefits uh, as public institutions, archives, museums, libraries are all in the service of society. But uh, what we are really concerned with is how this can turn the other way around. Uh, what I would also like to say, uh, Vladka uh, uh, rightly um, uh, saw that uh, missing competencies in skills in the sector uh, are evident. Uh, I think the huge responsibility lies in universities because they keep producing people uh, in a very traditional uh, uh, way. Uh, and they end up in museums, in our institutions. They lack uh, not only digital skills, but they also lack this awareness of the need to contact with the users. Mm -hmm. So if you have this uh, somehow uh, uh, um, uh, ivory tower yeah. in institutions, yeah. This, uh, 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 this link with the society that is booming, that is getting more and more interest in, uh, interested in cultural con uh, uh, contents, uh, becomes critical. And that is why what you have said, uh, there is a greater impact of non-professionals in the sector, and this trend will grow. Yeah. 
this trend will grow whether we as experts would like it or not. Uh, so how to balance these uh, is, is really something uh, that will be of great concern in future, either of academic yeah. society but also in, in heritage sector as well. Yeah. Yes, thank you for that. Indeed, um, uh, one of the input uh, we had, it was precisely that, that um, uh, there are no educational di directions, studies, courses even, that prepare people properly, even in terms of specializations or in terms of the depth of, um, of competences that you're describing. Um, I think a lot comes from, uh, this is such a big, uh, big conversation. I think, but, but I'll say the, the sentence. A lot comes from a sense of um, arrogance and elitism about the public the citizen, and because of this contempt for democracy, that's my, I, this is how I, I can locate this. It's a contempt for democracy, through democracy perhaps, and the citizen, because if we took the citizens, citizens seriously, their educational levels would have been better, um, access to university would have been better, our cultural institutions would have been more democratic, better funded, um, and so on and so forth. And the other dimension of this contempt is populism, right? So I think, and if we look at Europe at this point, I had this comment yesterday, I hate repeating myself, but we're regressing, and it's very, very worrying. We're regressing to states of crude um, and freedom. So this is a symptom, I think, of the value we put on publicness and democracy. Doesn't help in what I said, I know, at this moment. I have no solution. <laughs> Thank you very much for, for the response. There are a few questions, but uh, I think we can continue over coffee because we ran out of time. Oh my God, thank you. Put it on the evaluation form. There's evaluation form here. It's crazy. It's the first conference I go on this evaluation form. <laughs> okay, let's go. They don't want coffee. <laughs> thank you. Wow. <laughs> wow. Sorry if I'm keeping all of you and uh, Professor Serikakis by my question, but uh, uh, I would like to ask you, uh, how you, how do you see the establishment of digital single market uh, in relation to cultural cooperation within the EU or within Europe? Do you think that it can somehow boost or help uh, uh, more interaction, particularly in the audiovisual production? Thank you. I was thinking about it very much, and I, I, was, I was wondering whether I should uh, mention it here. But um, I think that um, it would require enormous coordination to cooperate among um, nation states that have uh, similar, um, similar issues at stake. Um, we don't have the same issues at stake with Germany or Austria. At one panel, I suggested that an immediate way, th th this leaflet is somewhere out there, um, when the um, revision of the audiovisual services directive was going on. With a colleague, we suggested that the um, uh, one way to enhance European quotas uh, without um, a, a more um, uh, strain on the very small finances of especially several countries is to agree that uh, European broadcasters would share content and would make it available. So European Public Service, 
with the logic that we pay already, everybody. And of course, uh, this does, did not, <laughs> does not go down well. There is the EBU that does uh, part of that, coordinates, shares some uh, content, but actually we meant something more. And as a matter of fact, we even suggested that any content, any program in private broadcasters also, that has a part of it funded publicly, directly or indirectly, should become available throughout Europe to all citizens. I didn't find a lot of funds, this idea. Having said that, it's a very logical, reasonable proposal that does not um, necessarily infringe copyright or that can help us go around copyright. There's many, many, uh, there is potential there. But may I be turn back to my pessimistic kind of, <laughs> Okay, no, it's not pessimistic, it's critical. I have two children, I have to be optimistic, otherwise, why did I have them? So, um, again, these are tactics, and we should grab them and use them and maximize any little space we have to do anything we can, but they don't form a strategy. The strategy has to be discussed elsewhere and cannot be, uh, a strategy does not conform, a tactic conforms to something given. Strategy, you do it from a position of power. You wanted to say something? You called me yeah. cool, so you must talk now. <laughs> yeah, okay, I'm, 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 I'm gonna try to cut it short. My name is Hrvoj Hriver, I'm film director, I'm not a scholar. And uh, uh, first of all, I wanna thank you for this comprising and so sensible, you know, deep running, uh, uh, lecture. Thank you. And uh, I just want to address one uh, interesting circumstance mm -hmm. uh, that we, again and again, we are talking about public television. This is very interesting. And I fully agree with most of what you said. I mean, people would expect that we will have an engaged debate on the Netflix business strategy, what is Amazon, what, what, what the big operators do, and we talk about uh, public operators in Europe because there is a very serious and deep reason for that. Mm -hmm. Because they found the way to become the key dramatic player in a drama where they are not actually protagonists. Mm -hmm. They are using their position, which is not uh, Television Sans Frontières, that is Pouvoir Sans Frontières, that they are gained, mm -hmm. because they are double-sided structures that have the public capital in the name of the public mm -hmm. cause, and let's say commercial strategy, so linked with politics, mm -hmm. because also they are king makers. Mm -hmm. So they're always, this is my personal and first hand experience from the uh, European institutions, mm -hmm. they are first to come mm -hmm. to the European politicians mm -hmm. because they are uh, global operators who are offering some financial hope, the hope for uh, financial transformation mm -hmm. and for the big gain <coughs> and uh, the public televisions are offering the political support because mm -hmm. they are king makers mm -hmm. and this ambivalent structure somehow I'm, I'm feeling this for ages is definitely the key obstacle to the open dialogue and to some flow of, of energy in either way in this debate. In the next panel, we will probably go more concretely in what's happening there. And in this play of chess in the, within the directives and regulations, mm -hmm. this role of uh, public television is very obvious. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Just a little note only to add to this conversation uh, that not all public service broadcasters were created equal. And uh, some are also global players, and some have been brought to the position of 
mouthpieces of, you know. So again, and we have also stopped criticizing public service media because we have a bigger beast to deal with. As academics, I'm saying this, maybe as intellectual community also. Um, yeah, between a rock and a hard place, stop finishing with this cliche, apologies. <laughs> um, thank you. <laughs>